Okay, we're in Judges chapter 20, and I'm going to read beginning in verse 36 to the end of the chapter. Judges 20, verse 36 to the end of the chapter. So it says this, So the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites, because they trusted unto their, the liars in wait, which they had set beside Gibeah. And the liars in wait hasted and rushed upon Gibeah, and the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. And when the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill of the men of Israel, about 30 persons, for they said, surely they are smitten down before us as in the first battle. But when the flame began to arise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed, for they saw the evil was come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them, and them which came out of the cities they destroyed in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men, all these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness and the rock Rimmon, and they gleaned of them in the highways 5,000 men, and pursued hard after them into Giddim, and slew 2,000 men of them, so that all which fell that day of Benjamin were twenty and five thousand men that drew the sword. All these were men of war, valor. But six hundred men turned and fled to the wilderness unto the rock Rimmon and abode in the rock Rimmon four months. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword as well the men of every city as the beast and all that came to hand, also they set on fire all the cities they came to. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. So our, our title this morning is a very simple one, Vengeance and Vows, because we're going to spill over into the following chapter and look at some of the vows that the children of Israel had made and the difficulties these vows caused them. And so Vengeance and Vows. And we said that really from verse 36 and the second part uh, from uh, the, the phrase, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites, basically what we have is a repetition of what we've already seen uh, in the previous verses, which is a kind of a description of the battle. But as typical in Hebrew, uh, you get a more detailed and supplementary account of the battle. So quite often you'll see this pattern in Hebrew writing that they'll have a general account and then they'll have a repetition with a more detailed, more specific account. So you see that in the creation account in Genesis, you've got a very kind of general account and then followed by a more specific account. And so that is just often the way Hebrew writing goes, very characteristic, repeating itself, but adding details. And so we're going to see added details of the ambush and its effects. Uh, upon them. So the strategy of the children of Israel had drawn the Benjamites uh, so far away from the city uh, that they were powerless to, to, to act, basically. So they, the Benjamites came out after them. They figured uh, that the children of Israel had fled at, as at the previous two battles. And so they followed them out. And basically, uh, they, there was going to be an appointed sign. And we want to notice about this appointed sign in verse 38. It says, now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and liars in wait, that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. So basically, what you've got is you've got those that are fleeing, and you've got some that have snuck behind. They're going to go into the city, and they're going to set the city up on fire and then you've got liars in wait in the wings as well on either side so it's kind of completely surrounding uh the 
Benjamites. And so once they saw the appointed sign, those that were fleeing away were suddenly to turn around and face their enemies. This is basically the battle plan. So what is this appointed sign? Verse 38 says, now there was an appointed sign. And it's very interesting that uh, that very phrase, an appointed sign from the Hebrew is translated elsewhere in the book of Jeremiah chapter six. And I want you just to look at Jeremiah six, the very same wording in Hebrew, but in chapter six of Jeremiah, the translators have translated it this way in chapter six of and verse one, O ye children of Benjamin, Interesting that Benjamin had mentioned again, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a sign of fire in Beth Hakarem, for evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. And this phrase, set up a sign of fire, is the same phrase that is translated here, uh, an appointed sign. And so basically, those that snuck into the city after the Benjamites had gone out after uh, the children of Israel that were fleeing, their, their job was to basically set the city on fire. And so that when they saw that, then those that were fleeing would turn around, they would chase after the, the Benjamites, those that were liars in wait on either side would close in on them, and they would have basically a pincer movement uh, that would completely surround and destroy uh, the men of Benjamin. So this was the agreed sign that when they saw the smoke ascending skywards, it would be a sign uh, that the main army would halt their retreat and turn back. And so it tells us when the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill all the men of Israel, about 30 persons. But they said, surely they're smitten down before as in the first battle. So they're, they're full of self-confidence. They've, they've won two battles already, uh, caused a great slaughter, 10% of the Israel army is being slaughtered. And now it's like business as usual. Another 30 have fallen and they're full of self-confidence. This is another easy victory, even though overwhelmed by great numbers, the Benjamites were confident in their ability to win this battle. But it says in verse 40, but, <laughs> and of course, whenever we see that word, it's always setting something in contrast. It says, but when the flame began to rise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them and behold, the flame of the city ascended up onto heaven. And so again, can you imagine their shock? They have no idea that there are these people behind uh, that are setting their city on fire. And so it really does strike them. In fact, it tells us uh, in verse 41, when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed, but they saw that evil or calamity was come upon them. And so we, again, we have very similar, we said this is very similar to the technique that was used in the battle of Ai. Uh, again, where, remember where the children of Israel fled as they had in the previous defeat, and yet they had uh, basically done the same thing. And I want you to look back to Joshua chapter 8 and verse 20, just to see the similarity. Uh, it says in, in Joshua 8 verse 20, it says, And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon the pursuers. And we had said that uh, perhaps what had happened uh, is that the Israelites, after two defeats, had come in confession, in genuine brokenness before the Lord. And uh, they had studied the word of God and they had seen about this previous victory against Ai and they borrowed that technique and used it against the Benjamites. And so we find the very same thing happening uh, in verse 41, that the men uh, of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed. They were kind of in shock, paralyzed, really. They, uh, the, the calamity had come upon them. They knew it. It says they saw that evil was come upon them. And so therefore, as a result of this, it says, they turned their backs before the men of Israel to the way of the wilderness 
in other words, they began to flee or attempt to flee from the battle, but the battle overtook them and them which came out of the cities, they destroyed in the midst of them. And so there's a tremendous, basically, a, a pincer movement and enclosure. Verse 43, thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about, chased them, and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. So everything's changed in the battle. From two defeats, now it's an easy victory. And they're, they're, they've surrounded them, and they're basically going to wipe them out. And this is where we begin to get into the, the extent of how devastating this would be for the Benjamites, because we start to get a list of how many people perished. And so it says, there fell of Benjamin, 18,000 men. All these were men of valor. So that's just the beginning. This is just the start. 18,000 people. And again, these are children of Israel. This is the tragedy. Uh, these are Benjamites from the tribe of Benjamin, 18,000 men men of valor slaughtered verse 45 they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock rim and they gleaned of them in the highway five thousand men so as they're pursuing the ones that are left they're pursuing uh, towards this uh, this goal of getting to this rock of rim it says they gleaned in the highways five thousand and so eighteen thousand now another five thousand and then they pursued hard after them to get them and slew 2,000 men. So now 18,000, 5,000, 2,000. So, you know, this again, this is just a massive slaughter. There, what we see is that the children of Israel are ruthless now in their wiping out their own people. So that verse 46, all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. These were men of valor. 25,000 men now wiped out. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at a math problem in a little while. So hold on. We'll get to, we'll get to the mathematic issue because there is a mathematic problem that we've got to address. But we're going to save that uh, until we get to uh, the final section in verse 47 and 48. But just to say that uh, the children of Israel had gained the victory, but they were ruthless in the final stages of the battle. And they, they, they didn't know when to stop. <laughs> it, it seems like they, they, they just went completely over the top in exercising this discipline. And I think there's a reason, and we're going to think about that reason in a moment. Um, and it's very important that as we uh, have to be involved in discipline, uh, there's a big lesson that we have to learn that we don't want to miss here. So the effects of the slaughter are given to us in verse 47 and 48. It says, 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness onto the rock rim and abode in the rock rim for months. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword, as well as the men of every city, as the beast and all that came to hand. Also, they set on fire all the cities that they came to. And so it was what we would call a scorched earth policy. Basically, anything that lived connected with Benjamin, including their cattle, was completely wiped out. All that's left of the entire tribe is 600 men, which means that in this process, men, women, children, and even their animals were wiped out, and the city was burned, cities were burned, and all that's left is 600 men who were at this place called the Rock of Rimmon. And so what we see here is absolute ruthlessness towards the tribe of, of Benjamin. A 600-man remnant left out of all of the, this, this marvelous tribe down to reduced to 600. Now, the, the tribes of Benjamin was undeniably guilty. Uh, there was no need, uh, though, for a complete slaughter as described here. It's too severe a judgment against the tribe of Benjamin, and the children of Israel would soon regret this. And what it's telling us is that sometimes our zeal 
in our zeal, even if we have a righteous cause behind us, often goes beyond proper limits. <laughs> uh, often we find it hard to put the brakes on uh, when we're acting uh, in zeal. And I want to suggest to you that as we talk about discipline, because this really was a discipline issue. Uh, it, it could have been handled a lot better if the Benjamites had just handed over the men of Gibeah. It could all have been dealt with, but it ends up being civil war. And often discipline, if it's not handled properly, ends up just causing God's people to tear one another apart, uh, biting and devouring one another. But I believe that what happened is the two defeats of Israel, losing 40,000 men, they no longer were acting on behalf of God and exercising discipline for God, it became personal because they'd lost 40,000 men. And when it becomes personal, <laughs> we lose all perspective and it becomes very, very damaging. We've got to remember, and again, I'd like us to look at Matthew 18. Now we know this verse and we know it uh, from a very different context, but I want us to just look at Matthew 18, and it's about discipline, really. This section is about is about discipline. Matthew 18, and we'll we'll break in um, in verse 15. He says, "Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee." one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. Verily I say to you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And here's the simple point that when discipline is being carried out, we're acting in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? In other words, we're, we're, we're doing it for him because it's his honor that has been compromised by the sin. And so any discipline has to be for his sake, for, for, for doing it in his name. We're doing it because we want his testimony not to be sullied and be destroyed. And so we're acting for him. But the minute we act for ourselves, the minute it becomes a personal thing, that's when we lose all perspective. And that's when harshness comes in. That's when uh, people go too far. Uh, we, we lose that, that compassion. Uh, it, it becomes a mess. It becomes a disaster. And that's exactly what has happened here, that they have lost all perspective. It's become a personal thing. Benjamin have slain 40,000, 10% of their army. And it seems to me that they're interested in getting even. And they're no longer seeing it as uh, acting on behalf of the Lord to purge from among them uh, that which is destroying the testimony. And so let's think about the mathematics now for a moment. So if you look at chapter 20, verse 15, you get the original number of men of Benjamin that are men of valor that are going to battle. And it says the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 20 and 6,000 men that drew sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered at 700 chosen men. So our start figure is 26,700. OK, so that's what we're starting with. Benjamites, including Gibeah, 26,700. Now, we've already seen that we we've already lost quite a number. 18,000 was the first number in verse 44. Uh, they fell of the Benjamites, 18,000 men. And then again, another 5,000 in verse 45 and another 2,000. And that gives us uh, from verse 46, 25,000 men. So 25,000 of 26 1,700, right? So that should leave us um, 1,000, what is it? 1,000, 
um, 100 should be left, something like that. So, so, <clears throat> and yet there are 600 left. Um, so we still have a problem because if you add 25,100 to the 600 that left, it gives you 25,700. So we're still missing a thousand men. What happened to those thousand men that are unaccounted for? Were they just missing in action <laughs> or what happened to them? Well, I want to suggest to you that when the first two days of battle took place, remember, we were told that there were 40,000 of the Israelites slain. But we're not told about how many Benjamites were slain. And really, I think the simple answer is that perhaps those 1,000 were slain during the first two days of battle, giving us a grand total of 26,700 that were lost. The tragedy, really, of all this is that as you think about the tribe of Benjamin, and I want to just kind of give you the uh, kind of a sense of things here. Go back with me to the book of Numbers. And what you're going to see here is a withering away of the tribe. In Numbers chapter 1 and verse 37, remember the book of Numbers is called the book of Numbers because you have these two numberings of those that are able to go to war. Uh, the first group and then after uh, the wilderness wanderings, uh, the, the new group are numbered. So Numbers 137 uh, says, uh, those that were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Benjamin, were 30 and 5,400. So they, they start out with 35,400 men able to go to war. And then Numbers 26, we see that next generation that are ready to go into the land is actually increased in number. So it starts with a, with a great increase. Numbers 26, verse 41 says, these are the sons of Benjamin after their families that they were numbered of them were 40 and 5,600 men. So at a peak, the tribe has reached 45,600. But by the time we get to the book of Judges, they've withered down to 27,600. And now by the time we get to the end of the book of Judges, we're down to 600. That's a tremendous reduction, isn't it? From a peak of 45,600, now to 600. What a tr price the tribe of Benjamin paid for refusing to obey the Lord and cooperate with the Lord in the discipline of the men of Gibeah. And when we're not faithful to the word of God, there's always a price to pay. It's a huge price. And certainly we can see it here uh, from 45,600 down to 600, which takes us to the next chapter because there's only 600 men. They don't even have wives. And so potentially the tribe is in danger of being wiped out forever so you have vengeance in this chapter we've just completed and now we come to the following chapter chapter 21 and we move from vengeance to vows so while benjamin was wrong to side with the guilty the severity of the children of israel and their scorch Ur scoth urged policy has to be questioned was it zeal for god and his holiness and a genuine hatred of sin or was it revenge for the two early defeats to the tribe of benjamin that motivated them and we would have to say it has to be the latter we must not suppose or use supposed righteous indignation to settle old personal scores. We can't allow things to become personal. And sometimes when we do that in the assembly, it's, it becomes about me. And it's not about me. It's about the Lord. We can't allow it to become about us. And that's the tragedy that happened. But now, after this incredible victory that the children of Israel have experienced over Benjamin, you would think, you know, usually after a great victory, 
how does it follow up? Well, usually it's a time of song and a time of rejoicing, right? Because God has given us the victory over our enemies. Uh, you get that, don't you? As they crossed uh, the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army uh, was destroyed. And then what, how do they, well, there's a great song, uh, book, the, the story in Judges of Deborah and what happens after the great victory that they had won. Uh, well, there's there's the song of Deborah, right? There's a great song of triumph. But notice here, instead of a song, there's anguish. Uh, and so in verses one through nine, we've got, we're going to see anguish over Benjamin. Any feelings of euphoria following the victory over the Benjamites were quickly dampened as it dawned upon the men of Israel that there was, in their words, one tribe lacking in Israel, one tribe cut off from Israel this day. Notice verse three, and said, O Lord God of Israel, why is this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? Verse six, the children of Israel repented them for Benjamin, their brother, and said, there is one tribe cut off from Israel this day. And so instead of euphoria and joy in victory, there's a great lament now because one tribe is in danger of being wiped out. Part of the difficulty was that they'd made a vow. So you got these 600 men, all their wives, children, all wiped out. We've just got 600 left, that's all of them. And they're all fighting men, men of Benjamin. And so it says in verse one, now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah saying, there shall not any of us give his daughter to Benjamin to wife. Now, in, in some ways, you can understand this, right? Because the Benjamites had tolerated a great sin. They didn't commit the sin. It was the men of Gibeah that committed the sin. Although they were Benjamites, but it wasn't all of them that had been committed the sin. But but their their problem was that they 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 allowed loyalty to their tribe to take precedence over loyalties to the Lord, and they refused to deal with sin uh, amongst them. And so the children of Israel said, we, "We don't want to marry our daughters to these men because they're men that are not serious about holiness and sin, serious about sin. Uh, they 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 were happy to just allow it to go unpunished and so there's no way we want to have our daughters linked with such depraved men that have no standards so they make a vow and that vow dominates this chapter and it, it's interesting that it's mentioned three times in the chapter and each time it's mentioned it gets stronger so let's just notice this uh, verse one is the first time we've already read it, but just let me read it again. The men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, "There shall not any of us give his daughter to Benjamin to wife." Verse seven: How shall we do for wives for them that remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them of our daughters to wives? So initially they just sworn in Mizpah. Now it says they sworn by Jehovah. We've sworn by the Lord. In other words, we've included the name of the Lord in this in this vow. And verse eighteen, the final one: Howbeit we may not give them wives of our daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn, saying, "Cursed be he that gives a wife to Benjamin." So we're not only making a vow; we're actually saying that anybody who would do this is under a curse. <laughs> and so, and you can see each time the language gets stronger. And so they made this vow and now they're, they're committed. They, there's, how can they back away from this? They also made a second vow at Mizpah as well. So the first one is we're not going to marry any of, of our people uh, to the men of Benjamin. The second one is uh, given to us in verse 5, it says, The children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel that come not up with the congregation to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning him that came not up to the Lord to Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And so the second oath was, Anybody that didn't show up to fight against Benjamin, any tribe that didn't come or any uh, portion of a tribe, they would be wiped out if they refuse to come to this battle. 
So the two oaths can be summarized as this. No marriage for Benjamin, verses 1 through 4, and then no mercy on absentees, verses 5 through 9. So two vows made. Now, again, is there a biblical basis in the vows? Certainly there was no biblical basis for forbidding intermarriage between the tribes. That was something that took place. It wasn't something that was restricted. It was only the restriction was they were not to marry the people of the land, <laughs> All right? The Canaanites, not the Benjamites, but the Canaanites. So they, this rash vow is going beyond scripture. Now you can understand to a certain degree why they didn't want to do it because these men in their minds are not serious about God's holiness. But there was certainly no biblical basis for forbidding this um, intermarriage between tribal groupings. Um, by the way, it's just an interesting thought, and I want to just say this, that um, uh, when you look at the genealogy of the Lord Jesus, one of the things that stands out is that it's a genealogy of grace. Now, in fact, when we get to the book of Ruth, we're going to see that, that um, the great hero um, in that book, uh, Boaz, his mother was Rahab the harlot. Kind of interesting, right? I mean, can you imagine uh, Salmon uh, coming and bringing his prospective wife to meet the mother-in-law? Oh, what tribe are you from, honey? Well, actually, I'm not from one of the tribes. I'm a Canaanite uh, from, from the cursed city, from Jericho. Oh, and what did you do before you met Salmon? Oh, actually, I was a prostitute. <laughs> uh, can you imagine uh, doing that? Uh, that certainly might uh, cause mother-in-law some fits there. But again, it was a genealogy of grace. And there's Tamar in there. Uh, there's Bathsheba in there. And of course, there's Ruth the Moabitess in there. Isn't that amazing? And sometimes we, we, so, we can be so uh, restrictive uh, in who we want our little girl to marry, right? I mean, she's got to be able to prove a genealogy all the way back to the early brethren. And if she, she can't, well, <laughs> we can't allow this. Where, where's grace in our thinking? Do we, do we understand the grace of God that he's able to save to the uttermost those that come to God by him? And so we just need to be aware of this. Uh, they, no marriage with the Benjamites. Is that saying God couldn't work in the Benjamites, soften their hearts and make them realize the error that they had made? Is that saying that God can't do that? So we, we just got to be careful that we oper always operate on the principle of grace. And sometimes that goes out of the window, especially when it comes to my little girl. <laughs> I can't allow that. See, so we got we to think about those things. Also, we need to be careful, and the scripture warns us again and again and again about making rash vows. Be careful about vows we make in the presence of God, because sometimes it can, it can put us in a bind that makes it very difficult to maneuver. And certainly that's what's happened here with the nation of Israel. They made these vows in the presence of God, and their, their hands are tied in themselves. They, they got themselves in a, in a bit of a, a mess. And so verse 2 says, the people came to the house of God and abode there till even before God and lifted up their voices and wept sore. It's kind of almost a bit late now, isn't it, to be, uh, to be crying about the outcome of the campaign. Tears replaced the song that would have accompanied victory had it been over a foreign enemy. The only people who would have been really celebrating this, the events of these these days would be the Canaanites as they stood on and watched the Isra Israeli people basically tearing one another apart. And you know, Satan is the most delighted person when the Lord's people destroy themselves from within. In fact, that's part of his whole strategy. He would love to have us fight in each other so that while we're doing that, we're leaving him alone. 
His kingdom is unthreatened. His dominion is not disturbed because God's people are literally tearing themselves apart limb from limb and the enemy rejoices. So they're, they've got tears, but is it for their sin in going over the top or is it for the consequences of their sin? It would seem from what follows, it's the latter that's in view. Because we've, we've got ourselves in this predicament now. We've got a tribe that's in danger of perishing in Israel. And so it said, verse 3, they said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel? Well, the reason it's come to pass in Israel is obvious. <laughs> because they went over the top. Because they, they made it a personal thing. They haven't been willing to admit that the reason they're in this predicament is partly because of the role that they had played in going too far. Their actions may have been right in their own eyes. They could have justified them, but they had carried it out in such a vindictive, selfish, and legalistic manner that they found themselves with no room to maneuver. As they now decided they wanted to act more graciously, they're really stuck. And how do they go back? And I wonder, too, you know, just this is a challenging thought to us. Do we weep that there's a withering away of the testimony amongst us? There's so little growth in many places. Do we care that in many places the lampstands are either removed or hardly shining at all? Do we lament that as we look at the assembly address book that um, people that update that keep telling us that uh, that we're getting less and less every year the book is getting thinner it's getting smaller and it seems like we're getting in reduced numbers all the time and often it's due to fleshly and carnal infighting that we're being reduced are there tears for our part ca Colts has a very interesting statement he says what a dreadful thing it would have been if one stone had to be torn out of the high priest's breastplate. Now think about that. Remember, he's it's it's got the 12 tribes represented with 12 stones. And imagine if Benjamin, his stone has to be ripped out. And now he's going into the presence of God on behalf of 11 tribes. If we could only see things according to God's perspective. If they saw it from God's perspective, they couldn't bear to think of Benjamin being lost. It would have brought genuine sorrow. And it should bring genuine sorrow when anybody leaves our number. When somebody refuses to identify with us anymore. When somebody leaves. And oftentimes we just say, well, they never understood assembly principles anyway. Or we just write people off. Well, they, you know, he was a blessed deduction. Uh, you know, it's very good to easy to do that. And, and instead of lamenting at the loss, the loss of harmony and the loss of fellowship. So what do they do? Well, it says that they offered sacrifices to the Lord. We see that in verse four, it came to pass on the morrow that the people rose early and built there an altar. And again, it's not a rival altar. I think there was just so many sacrifices that the, the altar in the house of God wasn't sufficient to deal with the sheer numbers. So they build this altar uh, tomorrow uh, on the morrow and they offer burnt offerings and peace offerings. But notice they're not offering a sin offering. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> the burnt offerings and peace offerings, but no sin offering is mentioned. Maybe that would have been appropriate because of their sin of overly zealous uh, in executing uh, God's discipline, but making it a personal thing. So now what they're going to do, that's their problem. So they come, they, they, you know, they, they weep, they, they do the offerings, all of this. But verse 5, it says, the children of Israel said, who is there among all the tribes of Israel that came not up with the congregation to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning him that came not up to the Lord to misper, saying, he shall surely be put to death. So what are they trying to do? It's interesting. They don't, in, in coming before the Lord in tears and their offerings, you notice that they don't say to the Lord, what should we do? 
what can we do for Benjamin? He's, he, he's, you know, we've made this vow. Lord, is it, how do we go forward? We, we don't know what to do. Our eyes are upon the guiders, you know, guide us all thou great Jehovah. They're not doing that. In fact, what they're going to do is they're going to resort to worldly wisdom to solve the problem. They're going to use another vow that they've made to at least kind of deal with the problems of the, the first vow they made. And that's going to result again in tragic deaths. Another slaughter is going to be used. And so, again, one rash vow is going to be used to solve the problems created by the first rash vow. And the result is going to be another slaughter on the scene. And we just need to recognize how much we need divine wisdom as we're dealing with the Lord's things. I want you to look with me at James chapter three, just for a moment. And I want you to see something here about the, the, the two types of wisdom, the wisdom that is from above and the wisdom of the world. And they're so opposed to each other. Incredible, really, to see it. Verse 13 of James three, it says, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts glory not and lie not against the truth this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly sensual devilish isn't that amazing language in other words when we resort to worldly wisdom to solve problems often of our own making it's always the same it's earthly sensual devilish and it's always a disaster for where envying and strife is there is confusion and every evil work but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle easy to be entreated full of mercy there wasn't much mercy was there in the way the children of israel were acting towards their brethren the benjamites full of mercy and good fruits without partiality without hypocrisy and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace so they don't ask the lord lord we need heavenly wisdom we've got ourselves in an awful predicament we acknowledge our failure it was our zeal that led to this our taking things into our own hands there's no crying out to the Lord, show us what to do. But instead, they turn to this another rash vow they had made. That was that if anybody doesn't come up, they will be slaughtered. So it tells us the children of Israel repented them for Benjamin, their brother, and said, there's one tribe cut off from Israel this day. How shall we do for wives, for them that remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them of our daughters to wives? So again, <laughs> it, it, how can we deal with this? We, we, we got this problem. How can we deal with it? And they said, verse 8, what one is there of the tribes of Israel that come not up to Mizpah to the Lord? And behold, there came none to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. So ah, now we found out what we can do. The men of Jabesh Gilead, they were missing. Let's go and wipe them out and take virgins from them, and that will solve our problem. The result, of course, would going to be more destruction of lives. So who, who are these people from Jabesh Gilead? And again, we, we want to see that they're, they're their own people again. Verse 9, the people were numbered, and behold, there were none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead there. So who are these people? Look back to the book of Numbers, chapter 26, and we'll find out who Jabesh Gilead were. And verse 29, Numbers 26, verse 29, it says, of the sons of Manasseh, of Machir, the family of the Machirites, and Machir begat Gilead, of Gilead come the family of the Gileadites. The Jabesh Gilead, descendants of Manasseh. Now, who was Manasseh? Well, he is one of Joseph's sons. Remember, Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So these are descendants of Manasseh, descendants of Joseph's sons. 
So again, there's a real family link here, isn't there? Perhaps the reason they didn't come up um, to fight against Benjamin is because there's a close family tie there again, isn't there? Because uh, if you remember, Benjamin and Joseph both had the same mother. And so basically, uh, Manasseh's grandmother was the same as Benjamin's and so, uh, which was Rachel. And so, again, th there's this strong family tie. And so perhaps that's the reason that they didn't come up to fight against Benjamin because, again, of the, the family connection. And so <clears throat> how are they going to solve this problem? Well, it's simple. We'll just do some more killing. <laughs> that's how we'll deal with this problem. And so we read in verse 10, the congregation sent to the... 12,000 men of the valiantest and commandest them saying, go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the children. This is the thing you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman that hath lain by men. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, 400 young virgins that had known no man by lying with any male that they brought them into the camp of Shiloh, which is the land of Canaan. So everybody's to be wiped out except any woman who had not lined with a man. So any virgin. Everybody else, men, women, and children of Jabesh Gilead are to be wiped out. Now, again, where, where are they getting this, this idea from? Where does this come from? This is the exact same strategy that was used in the book of Numbers, chapter 31. But again, not against God's people. This was used against the Midianites. If you notice the language of Numbers 31, verse 17 and 18. Now, therefore, well, let's just read from verse 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. But all the women, children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves." So the very same strategy that was used against God's enemies, the Midianites, is now used amongst the people of God. We'll wipe out everybody, and the only ones that we will leave alive are the virgins. And they find 400 young virgins, and of course, when they find them, well, they give them to the men of Benjamin. So they found, verse 12, among the inhabitants of Jabesh, 400 young virgins that had not known a man by lying with any male, and they brought them to the camp of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. And the whole congregation sent some to speak to the children of Benjamin that were in the rock rimmon and call peaceably to them. And Benjamin came again at that time, and they gave them wives, which they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, and yet so they sufficed them not. And they repented before. Uh, them for Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. So again, uh, they, in order to keep their vows, it results in a cruel and an extreme uh, wiping out of Jabesh Gilead, everybody, men, women, children, all except the virgins. And again, which we can't help but keep going back to Galatians 5, lest ye bite and devour one another beware that you be not consumed one of another and again the flesh will have us basically eating one another alive and uh, we, we tragically we're seeing this happen amongst the children of israel but there still is a lack we've got 600 men we got 400 virgins that leaves 200 how are we going to deal with this shortage of 200 wives for the remaining men of Benjamin. There were no more cities eligible for destruction. And so they have an elders meeting to discuss it uh, about this problem. How are we going to deal with this? Look at verse 16. Then the elders of the congregation said, how shall we do for wives for them that remain, seeing the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? Again, notice there's no asking the Lord at all for guidance in any of this. 
This is worldly wisdom. This is an elders meeting where the elders of Israel are meeting together and they're not meeting with open Bibles. They're not meeting seeking the will of the Lord for how to act in these instances. They're resorting simply to wisdom, which is from beneath worldly wisdom, earthly wisdom. And so this elders meeting becomes a, a time of scheming and plotting about how we're going to deal with this. And so what did they come up with? Well, it says, verse 17, they said, there must be an inheritance for them that be escaped to Benjamin, that a tribe be not destroyed out of Israel, howbeit we may not give them wives of our daughters, for the children of Israel are sworn, saying, cursed be he that gives a wife to Benjamin. So they've got a real predicament. And the solution is simple. How about a little innocent kidnapping and rape? How about that for a solution? Yeah, let's do that. Let's just kidnap and rape. That's a good way of dealing with it. And so that's what they suggest. Then said, and then they said, behold, there's a feast of the Lord in Shiloh. And let's do it on one of the holy convocations of Israel. <laughs> yeah, let's do it on a feast day. That's great timing, isn't it? Can you imagine? Uh, uh, one of the, the holy convocations, the set feasts of Israel. So I said, behold, there's a feast of the Lord in Shiloh, yearly, in a place which is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, on the south of Le Lebona. Therefore, they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, go and lie and wait in the vineyards. And many believe that because uh, the vineyards, that this feast is the Feast of Tabernacle, because there's going to be a dance. And of course, the Feast of Tabernacle is a time of rejoicing. Remember, it's a festival where they're not to afflict their souls, but everybody's to rejoice before the Lord. And it's a it's a big deal in the nation of Israel. And so they're suggesting, well, this is this would be a perfect time. Uh, they're going to be uh, the, the 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 virgins from Shiloh will be dancing, and you hide in in the in the uh, the vineyards, and then you just come out and you just grab yourself a wife and take her off with you. So they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, go and lie in wait in the vineyards. In other words, they got Benjamin to do their own dirty work for them. It solves their problem, but they're not, they're not doing it. The, the Benjamites are going to do it. So go and lie, lie in wait in the vineyards and, and see and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in dances, then come you out of the vineyards, catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin it shall be when their fathers and their brethren come unto us to complain that we'll say to them be favorable to us uh, to them for their sakes because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war for yet you did not give unto them at this time that you should be guilty and so this elders meeting not only did they come up with a worldly solution they also came up with the the excuse that they could give uh, you know, when the men of Benjamin, or, or, sorry, the men of Shiloh came and, and said, what's going on here? Uh, so they, they've thought through every aspect of it. Incredible, isn't it? The detail they've gone to. A little innocent kidnapping. The only problem is that kidnapping was in violation of the word of God. Just look back, please, at Exodus 21. Very clearly stated. Exodus, Exodus 21, verse 16, God's law says, and he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Deuteronomy, again, man stealing, kidnapping, human trafficking, whatever you want to call it. Deuteronomy 24, verse 7. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and maketh merchandise of him or selleth him, then that thief shall die and thou shalt put evil away from among you. And so even their solution was a violation of God's word. You're not to steal people. <laughs> you're not to traffic in people, even if you're going to steal them for your own purposes. You're not supposed to do that. This is not acceptable behavior. This is not good conduct. And so they do it. And it solves a problem. And Benjamin 
And sometimes it seems that worldly methods work for a while. But it's not honoring the Lord. It's not glorifying to him. I think of these poor girls. They're there at a festival of the Lord. And they're on the dance floor. And all around them are predators waiting to take them. What a tragedy, isn't it? And they took them. Whether they agreed to the marriage or not was irrelevant. <laughs> they were taken against their will and used. And that's the tragic story. Now our time has gone. We'll wrap up and then move into the more beautiful story of Ruth, Lord willing, next time. And it's going to be like a breath of fresh air to us, I think, after these last chapters. But again, from a practical standpoint, brethren, we, we need heavenly wisdom. When we bring worldly wisdom into divine things, you need to remember it's earthly, sensual, devilish. And even though it may seemingly work for a while, give the appearance, pragmatic success, it's contrary to the word of God. And it's, it's devastating in the long run. And are we lamenting for the withering numbers amongst not the tribe of Benjamin, but those that are gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus? Does it cause us to weep? Does it cause us to cry out to the Lord? Not for new techniques, you know, that are worldly wise to try and solve the problem, but to fall in the presence of God and say, Lord, Lord, help us. Your testimony is on the line here. We want your name to be glorified. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.